Yes, I can hear you. Okay, let's get started. So let's start. You cannot see your slides. That's the only problem. Okay, let me fix this. Okay. One thing to see the video of you, but it probably would be better to just share the slides that you're presenting. It will be much easier for us. Yes, I agree. Okay, sure first. Huh? Yes, I'm sharing. Yeah, yeah. I see it. Uh, yes, that one. Now you can do it. Yeah, that works great. You see now? Okay, fantastic. Yes. Okay, welcome uh, everybody. I am Mauro Sarda and I'm a PhD. I am a peer student at Telecom Polytech and a uh, software engineer in uh, Cisco Systems. So this is the presentation for my PhD, whose title is uh, Towards a Scalable and Programmable Deployment of PCI into the Current Internet. So let's start by giving some motivation. So uh, why we want to deploy this technology which is called ICL, which is the acronym for Information Sensing Networking. So basically there are a few motivations. Most of them are going to be evident at the end of the presentation. I start introducing a few of them here. So for first, we want to evolve the current need and infrastructure from being all centric to being uh, data centric, which means like now the current internet is built upon the, um, the fact that uh, the communication of your twin points, which are two locations in the network, which communicates together, like in a, um, as the telephone at the beginning of the cycle. But now the internet is evolving and it's becoming more and more data centric. So people are not more interested to connect to a certain location, but they are more interested to retrieve a certain piece of data, no matter from where the piece of data comes from. And this is the purpose of commercial internet networking, which puts the data itself in the, as a focal point of the internet. So moving the focus from the host to the data, uh, allows to enable a set of uh, features which are not uh, native in, uh, into the current uh, IP network networking, such as uh, native mobility, native multi-homing, multicast, anycast, and caching. And in addition, it allows to offload uh, many applications for network complexity because uh, many of the most of the operations they can be offloaded to the network. Finally, we also change the model of trust uh, because now what we do is basically securing the channel between two points. But uh, in the, if we put the data into, if we put data in the center of the, in the focus, we want to actually secure the data, so we are able to different models of trust. So, as a first thing, I will explain how this uh, ICN works. So this is the normal of based networking. Everybody knows it, uh, I guess. So if you have two users, Bob and Mark, which are requesting the same piece of video, which is called video.mp4. What they do is basically they connect to a server where the video is uh, stored, the video server, and then they, uh, they issue two requests for the video, the first by Bob and the second by Mark. You can see in, this, uh, in the picture we have basically two flows with the same information which is flowing into the internet. What we, in, with, with information into networking, the focus changes, so what Bob and Mark are addressing is no more the location of the video server, but they are rather addressing the video itself. So they are addressing video A.mp4. So what Bob does, and this way is acting as a consumer, is he send an interest. Uh, every I mean, spring letter, uh, every part of the router is uh, a keeper with a packet cache. This is an interest, which is basically a request for the video A.mp4. So this interest is forwarded by name until uh, the location, uh, until where uh, the first location where it's possible to find this video. In the first time, the first time is going to be the video server because the video server is the producer of the video. And then the video server will reply back with the data itself. Well, later Mark will issue an interest for the same content, so with A.mp4. The first data, the first router in the path, which contains a packet cache, will reply directly to this interest without forwarding further the request. So at the end, we're going to have just one flow into the network which goes upon the origin upon the origin uh, location of the video A.mp4. But at the end, the two, the two users are satisfied by the edge router uh, 
on the left, which is able to serve both of them directly to the packet cache. So more, more in details, how does it work? So this is a normal SM forwarder. So when an SM forwarder receives an interest, it looks in the packet cache if there is a, a data packet which can satisfy immediately this uh, interest. If there is, uh, it replies with the data. Otherwise, uh, it stores some information in the pending interest table. And in particular, it stores the interface of the interest scheme and the name itself uh, containing the interest. Then it does a few lookup. And if it finds an interface where to forward this interest, which is addressing a piece of data, as I told you before, it forwards the interest to the output interface. When the data comes come back, the router checks if in the pending interest table there is a pending interest for this data. It does an exact look at the cap, so the name must be the same. And if there is, the router forwards the interest back to the interface, uh, the data back to the interface where the interest came from. And in addition, you may also store the data packet to the packet cache. So this enables a set of uh, advantages. The first is that the data will follow exactly the same uh, path of the interest. The second is that if you receive two interests for the same uh, name, and uh, the, the first interest is still in the pending, in the pending interest table, the second one won't be forwarded, but will be just aggregated in the pending interest table. And then when the data will come back, will be forwarded in a multicast uh, fashion, like to the, all the interfaces uh, from where uh, the interest arrived. Third is data caching. This router can cache the data packet. And fourth is the pool-based semantic of this mechanism, because there is uh, basically no way for a data packet alone to be forwarded to a certain location. It always must be requested by an interest issue for the data packet. So this is basically the, how ICN works. My thesis basically develop on four main points. So the first is how we can actually deploy this technology on the current internet. Because as we know today, the internet is heavily based on TCP IP. So there is a classification of the internet. And developing a new, deploying a new protocol like ICN is going to be harder because the standardization of the new protocol. And also for the new, for, because there is, they need to be new hardware for forwarding those uh, packets. So right now we are hardware which is optimized for IP forwarding. The second point is basically how we can deploy this protocol on the endpoint. Nowadays, ICN uh, presents a lot of uh, theoretical libraries, which uh, basically they um, give the application the possibility to forward the uh, uh, interest and receive data and vice versa. But they don't offer the application and transport services itself, such as congestion controls, limitation of assembly, and crypto operation. So, the second point will be the second point. The third point will be how we can use this protocol for uh, supporting applications. Uh, I basically, in the thesis, I basically treat two cases. The first is HTTP, and the second is RTC. But uh, in the explanation, we just uh, uh, present the HTTP one. And finally, this uh, point I won't, uh, I won't be able to present it in this presentation, but uh, that is uh, basically the point is how we can manage, deploy, and configure HSN networks. For uh, this, I will show you a video. and. Uh, which basically presents more or less what uh, this uh, framework is able to do. So first point is uh, how we can implement the deploying ASEAN into the current internet. So uh, a clean slate approach, as I told you, would be like nice because uh, it's a new, it's a we create a new protocol. Basically, we don't have constraints. We can explore new alternatives. But it makes a option harder because uh, what exists in today, the management plane, the control plane, the data plane are IP based, so they won't be able to support a new protocol which uh, we may develop. And it is going to be harder for adoption. So, what we can do is uh, opt for a revolutionary approach which basically will uh, uh, incrementally deploy ICN, reusing as much as possible what is, what is available today. So we want to reduce the content management plane of IP, we want to reduce the hardware and the protocols, we want to reduce the existing software, and also we want to make uh, to reduce the previous ICM research and uh, the benefits uh, which uh, this, uh, this research provides. And of course, in addition, in addition, in particular, we want to preserve the ICM features which I described a bit at the beginning, like mobility, security, and forwarding, so on and so forth. So it is a new architecture. 
I started that in architecture because it's still based on Indian ECC Nix, which are the actual implementation of uh, the most, one of the most known implementation of ICN. So the structures are the same, the floating pipeline is the same, the features are going to be the same. But uh, we are going to integrate uh, hybrid ACN into the AP, AP protocol, in particular into PV6 and uh, IP, in particular into PV6, IPv6, but also into PV4. So instead of having isolated highlands, where uh, the SN uh, technology is implemented as an overlay, we're going to have uh, uh, basically uh, IDCN deployed the wind IP in the same infrastructure. And uh, only few routers, they will be able to understand the GCN technology. I will explain uh, better in the next slides. So we, those are the points for the simplification of this deployment. The first is naming. The second is the packet format. The three, how we can insert the into current network, and the fourth are the SOPTPI. So first point, we can use a P for name data. Uh, in, normally in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Vanilla ICN, uh, name is a combination of name components and computation information, which doesn't have to be human readable, uh, uh, which must be the, the, the specification doesn't require them to be human readable. An HCC name is basically an IPv, um, an IP address, it can be IPv6 or IPv4. I will use IPv6 in this uh, presentation also because uh, it allows them to have uh, bigger name spaces. And what we do is basically we divide this address in two parts. The first part, which is the readable prefix, and the second part, which is data identifier. We also have this computation info, which will be stored in another uh, header, which is the layer for header. I will present it in the uh, next slide. And basically, the full name is the concatenation of the IP address and the schematization information. So how those names are, I mean, how can a CM producer get those names and use them for name data? Well, for them, it is, uh, we, we thought about a name management uh, system, which is not so different than DHCP. So when a new producer joins a network, uh, it basically asks for network services, which is in charge to give those names to the, producer, uh, to the producers to get a prefix we can use for name data. And this network services will be basically in charge to give, to give those uh, prefix to the producer. So names are not immutable as in SN, but they are uh, under lease. So as soon as a producer joins a network and gets the name, and are reused. In particular, in many cases, it is better to use name instead of um, using them once and then forget about them. Those names are not location independent anymore. They are location uh, independent only in the context of a single autonomous system, which owns the prefixes, but uh, they are not uh, independent in the sense that if it's which autonomous system, we don't get the same name space because of course the name the prefix will be others. So the packet format is IP, as I told you. In this case, I will show, I will show you the PV6 packet. And the two main uh, structure of uh, ICN, which has interest in data, basically they differ uh, from the fact that the interest contains the name, the name prefix into the destination address. So that this data packet will be, be routed by name because it's routed using the destination address. The data packet is that as the name prefix into the source address, and it is routed as in ICN by following the same path followed by the interest, but only for what regards the HSN router. Not for, uh, not for, um, you won't follow the same path followed when it was uh, traversing IP routers. Because in that case, the routing, the forwarding is stateless, so the IP router did not uh, keep information about uh, the interest. The layer 4, we have uh, two protocols for the layer 4. So, uh, in our first uh, design, we use TCP as a layer 4 header, and we remap the basically the ICN uh, information in the fields of the TCP packet. In particular, the suffix, the name suffix, which is the segmentation information, is stored into the um, TCP sequence number. Uh, using TCP, uh, at the beginning, it looked, it looked like the best solution, but actually we met some uh, problems, in particular in traversing uh, the security appliances or condition trackers. So we switched to another implementation, which is uh, an UDP header, uh, at least for the first eight bytes. And then we mapped uh, in the next part of the header the same uh, fields of the TCP map. So basically, it's a TCP, it's like the TCP header, 
with a length and the checksum at the beginning for uh, for being uh, an OEDP and uh, for a normal EP routers. Uh, we can, for the insertion into existing EP network, we basically we, uh, the strategy would be like to just enable HSL in few routers, which are the router at the edge of the network, and use the IP core as it is. Will be able to forward those HCM packets without even realizing their HCM packet. So we will use, we will use the current um, uh, routing protocols such as OSPF and BGP. And uh, basically, uh, the HCM router they will be able to understand that, that one is not a normal IP packet with, uh, by looking uh, at the port in the layer for header. We have a specific port for HCM, and uh, if uh, they the HSL router sees an EP packet with a certain port, you can do the parting, and, uh, can, which means like the packet will be like a full, um, processed by another network function, which is called HSL virtual network function, and basically we do all the operations we saw in the, in the slide at the beginning. Um, and in particular, uh, if you enable an HSL router at the edge of the network, this doesn't require any other router to be aware of uh, the fact that there is a new HCM router because it's transparent for the other half. The forwarding HCM works uh, more or less in the same way of ACL with a little difference, which is the IP address of writing. So when, IP, uh, when, IP, when an HCM packet reaches an HCM node, the, packet, the router basically does the, for the interest, uh, as soon as it receives the internet, it stores into depending on the table of the information, which is the source address of the interest. And then, when it forwards the interest after the FIP lookup, it will put in the source address, the source address of the interface, which is forwarding the interest in that moment. When a data comes back, this uh, HSL router will basically take the, the destination address in the data will be the the address of the interface which is receiving the data. Then the router will remove this destination address and, will, uh, and after the PIT uh, lookup, will put into the destination address the address of the interface uh, which is uh, the address of the interest which was requesting the data. In this way, basically, the interest which will be forwarded, of course, by following the name itself, but the data will be routed back following exactly the same path followed by the um, interest packets for uh, what regard the HSCN uh, routers. So this is an overview of the wall architecture. Uh, we try to um, basically to, uh, to say, to check if uh, the HSCN uh, packets they were uh, able to actually traverse the current internet or not. So we did uh, a few tests. In particular, we test the end to end reachability. We wanted to see if uh, an HS enabled NHS enable consumer and NHS enabled user are able to talk uh, through a pure IP network. We test if you can traverse middle boxes. And finally, we test if you can uh, be, uh, if, if HSCN routers can talk with normal IP routers. So, as a first test, as a first test we did uh, basically um, a simple uh, test between one consumer and one producer at the edge of the network. By using as a names the for, as a name the public IP address of the producer. Uh, the path is a bit only we don't have a GSM router in this case. So in this case, in the case of academic and data center cloud context, we don't make problems by doing that. In the case of the national network, we still through firewall, we met some problem, which we overcame. At the beginning, we were using the TC calendar. So what we did is basically we set the same flag in interest and the rest flag in the data. So that this, those packets uh, look like the start of the of, uh, of a TCP connection. In the case of the enterprise, where we have a security appliance, is, uh, well, since the security supply appliance is basically mangling with the TCP sequence number, this uh, is not compatible with HCM because it changes the HCM name. So what we did is basically we did a first stop tunnel for forwarding those packets and uh, Basically, uh, this first stop tunnel can be really limited to the first stop because then, thanks to the whole of nature of SCN, uh, the packet can be forwarded normally without uh, having uh, additional tunnels. The second test we did is a large scale measurement. We 
which uh, took into consideration 48,000 prefixes announced by 14,000 autonomous systems. So if you consider at the time of the writing there were 14,000 autonomous systems for, for in the uh, 14,000 autonomous systems, this data set is almost able to cover, was almost able to cover the whole PV6 internet. So it's a, it's a quite exhaustive uh, test. And the methodology we used is quite easy. So at the beginning we started forwarding terrestrial traffic. We selected a given a prefix belonging to an autonomous system, we selected a given IP, and we started sending a terrestrial traffic to this IP. And we checked which autonomous system we were traversing and where our test route probe stops. So let's say it stops at the end point, at the point end. And uh, what we did later, we, we took an HCM packet and we sent this HCM packet into the network with the uh, time to leave equal to n. So as soon as we receive uh, an SMP packet of type 3, we call 0, which means like uh, that uh, IP packet, uh, which is actually an HCM packet, arrived up to that point and it was just discarded because uh, the op uh, count was 0. It means like that packet was able to traverse all the previous routers, which uh, also the traditional packet uh, traverses. And so we can basically say, okay, all the autonomous systems traversed by the test route uh, packet, and they are also supported by the HCM1. So, let's, uh, this is the basic table reporting all the results. Let's focus on the total one, because uh, it gives an overview. So, with, the, with our test route -like traffic, we managed to cover 40% of the whole uh, number of autonomous systems. And given this 40%, 40 we managed to cover 87% with HCM traffic, which is a good result. Also because we noticed that the autonomous system we don't cover, they were just tab autonomous system without customers. And uh, this is a good result also because the fact that uh, the trade, basically the trade, uh, traffic did not uh, go through, doesn't mean that also the HCM traffic uh, may not go through. So in the future we may be we are willing to improve those results by also checking if the HCM packets can cover the places where the traditional like traffic you don't, uh, don't pass. After uh, this first chapter, we, uh, it is uh, basically uh, explain how we can enable ICI into the current internet in the network level, but it doesn't give any, it doesn't cover the applications and then point where uh, ICI is basically still uh, and deploy. So, for that, we noticed that in HCN, the, in HCN in particular, there were not uh, clear trunk of services and socket API. And, uh, well, the fact that uh, the application were forced to send internet to receive data and vice versa, it can be like a nice thing because the application can have a packet level control of the communication, but on the other hand, it forces all the applications which want to use ICN to deal with uh, big problems like congestion control, segmentation graph assembly, and crypt operations, which are not too easy to implement, and not all the developers they want to deal with them, and they may put a limit on the ICN adoption. So we believe that one of the main reasons why this PFP, the, of the success of this PFP is the fact that uh, basically applications, they were able to write the, a, a piece of data to the network, as if they write into a file. So basically, for an application, there is no difference between writing a piece of content into a file or into the network, thanks to the API and the socket API. For SL, uh, luckily, it's not the case, because the application usually they send interest and exchange data and they need to deal a lot, about, uh, to deal a lot of problems, which, uh, which are given by the fact that there are no clear token services and API for SL. And in particular, applications are forced to, um, to work in a protocol with a unique granularity which means like nowadays we have an application, we have an application which is sending and receiving the IP packet, which is almost never the case. So the transfer services for JSON are uh, almost the same for uh, TCPIP. So we have the, for the producer, we have the segmentation, authentication, integrity, and naming. And for the consumer, we have fetching, rustling, verification, and flow congestion control. So the, the two sets of uh, service, transport services are mutually exclusive. It means like we can have two kinds of sockets. One is the producer socket, which is in charge of producing data, not sending data to the reports, but just producing data locally. And the consumer socket, which is in charge to retrieve a data from, from the network, basically. 
the API we developed is basically a remap of the existing uh, BSD socket API, which is a simple query model of a widely adopted. And it's uh, quite easy to insert into current application because most developers are familiar with this one. We create a new we design a new address family, address family is HACL. We create a new, the, the sockets are basically of two kinds, which are the first is the consumer socket, the second is the consumer socket. And the protocols, we don't give a limitation to the protocol here. In, in general, uh, generally speaking, we can have consumer reliable, consumer reliable protocol. And the same for the producer. The API is the same, but the semantic is a bit different. For instance, the JNCN send call won't send a packet to the other side of the network, but it will rather publish a packet locally, um, a packet, a piece of data locally. And this piece of data will be made uh, make available for other uh, consumers which want to retain. So, the, uh, as an additional transport services, which are not included into TCPP, but I see an, uh, requires them, are uh, the authentication and integrity services. So every data packet in SCN, so in HCN, must be signed by its producer. And, uh, every, and at the same uh, time, the consumer should like, verify the signature of the data packet in order for verifying the programs. For uh, authenticated packet, there are two ways. Uh, two ways. The first is the per packet authentication, where we put a signal to each data packet. And the second is the manifest authentication, which means basically we have a special packet, which is called manifest, and is signed by the producer. This packet contains the, basically the digest of all the other packets, which are a part of the same application data unit. And when the uh, consumer receives this manifest, he verifies first the signal to the manifest, and then he checks the ashes containing the manifest, they, Correspond to the ashes of the data packet received together with the manifest. If they match, the data can be trusted, otherwise, uh, it's up to the application to decide uh, what to do because basically it cannot guarantee the provenance of the data. But you see more detail how it works uh, into the pieces, uh, into the phases, uh, into the blocks, into the inside the, the, the sockets. So I start with the producer. The first the application called the same tool. Which is meant to publish a application to a unit locally. So the first thing that transport does is the segmentation and naming. So we give the application to the data unit, we segment it into a little packet, an empty um, size packet, and we put a name on them, which is then given by the name service that I described you at the beginning. Then the data packet are basically signed using the key of the producer, and then they're published into the local uh, auto buffer. When the transport receives an interest, the first thing the transport does is check if there is a corresponding data which can immediately satisfy the interest. In this case, the, in this case, the transport replied directly and the, with the data without even notifying the application. Otherwise, the application is notified with a signal which means like, uh, okay, I received an interest but they had no way for satisfying the interest. So, um, you should write properly, like for example, using the piece of data. The consumer socket works in the opposite way. The first thing a consumer socket does is start a data retrieval protocol, which can be like any flow control, flow congestion or control protocol. And this uh, protocol is in charge of sending the interest uh, to the producers. And those interests are sent to the network. Then, when the data comes back, the consumer does the verification of those data. He checks if the signal if the data comes from a trusted producer. And if yes, it proceeds to the assembly and it gives to the back to the application the application data unit is sent. So as we can see in this exchange, the application never dealt with interesting data. It just uh, dealt with application data unit as in the normal API, normal PSD socket API. So we developed a prototype of uh, this transport. Which, uh, and uh, by developing it, we took care of uh, performance and efficiency. So what we did is uh, we developed it in uh, using C++ and integrating it into the VPP framework. VPP is a vector packet processing, if you're not familiar with it, and uh, is able to forward the uh, packets in high speed using uh, normal uh, servers. 
and, uh, and um, basically avoiding to overdo um, give my system, continuous system goal by doing everything in, in the user space. Also, our implementation is through user space. So what we did is created a shared memory between the TCP forwarder and the transport tackle. And uh, we use this uh, shared memory for uh, exchange data without uh, calling a system, <coughs> system call per packet. So in this way, we are uh, using core into this overhead. And we also use the manifest for amortizing the crypto operation cost, which is uh, huge. And uh, in the next experiment, I will uh, show you how huge it is. Because uh, for, um, we, we evaluated this transport, uh, taking into consideration two. The first is the performance regarding segmentation reassembly, and the second is how signature identification can impact those performances, uh, this performance. In particular, um, we did a proof of it basically uh, an evaluation of this topology. We have basically one consumer and one producer, which is connected as a, which are connected as a tool to a PPP forwarder, and uh, they are running two different servers. And the two VPP forwarders are connected together using a switch, which is a Nexus switch. And uh, so for the packetization, we use a 1,500 bytes MTU. And uh, we need to use a hard of loading. So this is the evaluation of a pure software implementation, just for understanding how the crypto operation of SCI may, be, um, may be affect the performance of application which are using SCI. So the first thing, this is the good put of uh, an application level without any crypto operation. So we our implementation using uh, RAAQM, which is a data retrieval protocol uh, using, which is a congestion control protocol uh, developed by Jumana Configo a few years ago. Um, basically, about 36.53 gigabit per second. And given that this is a pure software implementation, we are already uh, better than uh, TCP IP in Linux, in Linux without uh, segmentation of loading and uh, lasting of loading. Still, we are uh, far from the VPP performance, which are uh, nice, so we still have work to do in this uh, context. But what's interesting here is the impact of the pit operation on those performance. So in, we, uh, basically, we took into consideration two cases, two cases for, uh, for this. So the first is synchronous publication, which means uh, uh, the producer doesn't produce anything, he starts producing a piece of content upon receiving the first interest from the consumer. So it means like this, synchronous publication takes into consideration the cost of computing the signature and the cost of defining the signature. The second synchronous publication is uh, meant for applications which are producing data in an offline uh, manner, which means like for instance, I am a file repository, I can just uh, produce a file for giving it available for consumers. And then, the, so the only cost uh, for consumers is the one who refined the signature, which was already in the packets. So in the first case, we can see that without using the manifest, we are uh, we have reached a good put at a prediction level of only 26 megabits per second, which is uh, which, so this is not a feasible solution. Using the manifest, we are still uh, in a good, uh, we still reach good, uh, good put, which is. Uh, is uh, acceptable, 525 megabits per second. In the second case, if you just verify the signature, we're able to reach 300 megabits in case uh, of synchronous publication and uh, in case of uh, per packet signature and uh, almost 1 gigabit in case of manifest, uh, in, case of manifest in particular, the cost uh, of the crypto operation is reported here. So the um, cost of uh, verifying a packet, the signature of the packet, in particular, here we are talking about RSA 1024 signatures, is uh, 52, 52 microseconds. In, for computing, the signature is um, much more, it's 440 microseconds in a per packet base. While the cost of, uh, of computing the hash on a per packet base is 9 uh, microseconds, but those 9 microseconds are still enough for uh, limiting the output uh, reached by application in the case of. Uh, Asynchronous publication just verifying the signal to using the manifest. So it's actually verifying the address. So, given this transport, basically we evaluated also uh, the benefits of putting a DSHC transport on the bottom of uh, uh, 
known uh, protocols, and in particular, we, in the thesis, I, I have two examples, which are HTTP and RPC. In this presentation, I will just present HTTP. Uh, so, HTTP over SCN is basically, um, at the first impact, you may think uh, HTTP is like HCN because it's a request repair protocol. But HTTP is not directly, it's not possible to map directly HTTP on top of HCN or ICN. Because uh, uh, basically what uh, HTTP does is it takes a request, which can be huge, for instance, an HTTP post or a, a file of loads on HTTP boot, and send this request, this request to the result using a push based protocol such as TCP. Uh, ICN works in a different way. So we cannot put directly HTTP on top of HCN, we need a middleware which is taking care of giving to the application which is using HTTP those push semantics. And uh, we call this middleware the best pool. And uh, the application can basically um, give a application data unit uh, to this uh, middleware, which basically take care of uh, taking the application data unit and uh, sending this application unit to the other side where there is the HTTP server. How this works? So basically, um, so Alice and the server, they exchange, uh, they do an initial handshake where the server gives to Alice uh, a function, which is called a function f. And this function f is, is used for calling a num for uh, computing a number, which is called request ID. So this, f, this function f says to Alice, okay, we'll compute the request ID. You should uh, just take into consideration a few fields of the HTTP request, which are not uh, only the fields which are related to the request itself. So for instance, the path, uh, the request path is uh, of course part of the data, so you can consider it. But for instance, the user agent, if you're using Safari or Chrome, that doesn't matter, so don't take it into consideration. So at, after Alice computes this request ID, it communicates the request ID uh, to the server uh, to with an interest. In addition, it also gives to the server the request name which is basically the name with, uh, which Alice is using for, uh, for publishing the HTTP request locally. The server does a reverse pool, reverse pool of the request uh, created by Alice. Uh, in particular, in the case of HSCN, Alice always has a routable prefix, so the server can always reach uh, the HTTP request in the load it. It computes the request, uh, the, the, the response, uh, corresponding to the request and associate the, risk, the manifest of that response to the request ID. And then Alice can download the response using norm, the normal ICM. Later Bob does the same. So uh, basically Bob is sending the same request to the server, so it will uh, end up completing the same request ID. As soon as Bob sends the request ID to the server, the server will see the request ID basically correspond to the same one sent by Alice before. Alice before. So there is a response or the available for the request of Bob. So instead of computing a new response, the server replies directly with the manifest containing uh, the information for retrieving the, 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 the HTTP response. And Bob can directly uh, pull the response without the server computing it and the Bob waiting for it to be ready. So supporting HTTP is important in particular for what regards the forwarding of video traffic because uh, now video traffic in internet is 82% uh, according to Cisco with network index and uh, if you in particular using this method we can be able to um, um, say uh, enable multicast in forwarding the video segments and to offload basically the, for, um, the, um, the forwarding to the network instead of having one single server uh, Replant all the requests from the, from the clients. So, in particular, the benefits you can bring to HTTP are three multicast caching and, uh, and the traffic of load. Uh, for evaluating this, we took into consideration one example, which is the uh, linear view distribution. In particular, we can think about a live sport event seen by uh, thousands of people. And uh, for our context, we limited the uh, number of people to 300. So, we have 300 dash clients are connected to an SCN enabled Apache traffic server. I want to underline that uh, we took an existing server uh, proxy, which is Apache traffic server, that we put inside the HCN using the socket I presented before. So this uh, proxy basically contains a 2 gigabyte cache, 
and they serve in 14 different channels. Uh, each touch client is running into a Linux container, and the set of uh, clients is asking uh, for a, is selecting the channel using a zip distribution with an uh, alpha factor of 104. And uh, what is interesting is that the HTTP request can be served by the transport or uh, on the network instead, in the, uh, instead of the video server itself. In particular, if, if we check the difference between the TCP IP and the SCM, because in the case of TCP IP, the video server, what it does is create a socket per client. Each one of the sockets is stateful, so it's actively pushing uh, the data to the, uh, to the clients. And uh, well, the clients are just waiting for the data to come to them. In the case of uh, HSL, what it happens is that the video server creates a single socket per channel. And this basically it just uh, produces the pieces of content into, into this socket. Then it's up to the consumers, which are pulling the content, to set the interest and uh, pulling those content. So basically the server becomes totally stateless. In addition, you can basically publish the response mass and make it available for many clients in, uh, at the same time. So this is basically a picture of the experiment. What we have is basically an Apache Topic server augmented with the HSM transport, which is connected to an HSM, an HSM, an HSM, an HSM router as well. The, the core is IP, so we have only IP routers in the middle. In addition, we put uh, an HSM router at the three HSM router actually at the edge of the network. Each one is uh, basically uh, serving um, yeah, 100 HSM consumer. is basically what they say, the transport is telling the point and the job is like GCM. So this is basically a table report in the results. Um, let me start uh, with the case of TCPP. So we did experiment in three different phases. In the first one we had 100 uh, clients, in the second one 200, and the third one 300 clients. So in the case of TCPP, we can see the number of requests seen by the server is increasing with the uh, augmenting with the increasing of the number of clients watching uh, watching the, the video distribution the video the live video distribution and in particular we can see for instance that um, there are a set of hit and miss uh, which are basically the hit and miss in the cache of the proxy itself and the memory and CPU usage. In the case of the HCL the context is different so um, Basically, in the case of HCL, the distribution is scaling only with the number of channels, not with the number of users. So in these cases, the number of channels are augmenting. You can see also the request seen by the server is uh, augmenting, but it's not augmenting in the same way that it's augmenting with the TCPP, because uh, the, number of, uh, the number of clients is augmenting 100 at a time. It's augmenting more slower, and in particular, we will be stable when we reach the 48 uh, channel launch. We can also notice in particular that the heat the cache of the proxy are zero in the case of GCN. And the miss, they correspond exactly to the number of requests seen by the Apache Talk server. This is because all the um, responses can be basically sat uh, satisfied, all the requests they can basically satisfy by the HCN uh, layer, either the transport or the network. And in particular, this is also um, reflected into the memory CPU. user. In the case of uh, HCN, the memory usage of the server is uh, much lower than the case of uh, TCPIP, as we can see in the picture. And this can be really useful for enhancing the scalability of servers by just giving them um, a bit of awareness, awareness of the content they are distributing. Another uh, thing we volunteered is the user, the more users per socket with the, by changing the by changing the number of watches per channel. Uh, it's still for with TCPIP, of course. Uh, the more are the watchers, the more is the memory required by the you know, TCP IP implementation in the kernel. In the case of HSL, uh, this, uh, this uh, memory requirement is basically constant because uh, well, since all the users are watching the same channel, this is the watcher per channel, we have one socket allocated per channel and then uh, the memory will, will stay stable as long as uh, we don't have another channel and so we need to create another HSL socket. Uh, the second plus basically reports the amount of traffic seen by the Apache traffic server or the IP core. The IP core is basically the, the two routers here in the, in the middle. 
So in the case of TCP, of course, Apache Traffic Service is on the traffic. In the case of HSN, it's at all the other endpoints. Apache Traffic Service is a certain amount of traffic, which is much lower than TCP, but still that because still uh, sees all the traffic. In the case of uh, HSN, it's at also at the edge, which means that like, those routers here are actively helping in uh, satisfying the request by the clients. We can see basically the um, also the IP core doesn't see a lot of traffic, which we see in, uh, by using a normal TCP HTTP over TCP solution. So last point on my thesis, I won't have the time to go through this, but basically uh, after all this uh, discussion, the focus will move on how we can uh, deploy, manage, and configure the existing networks. So we had uh, we developed a solution also for that, and this is an example of what we are able to do with that. So basically, in this, this is a demo we presented in Seacom. Uh, um, in this case, we had the real node with real applications. We, we had uh, links with emulated wireless uh, LTE or Wi-Fi. We put the uh, UPP forwarder in the middle, uh, which was enabling uh, ISP forwarding. The, this uh, deployment must be independent from the deployment infrastructure. If you put it in Amazon Web Services, it must be the same if you, if you put it in uh, any servers in Prima. And this is a video showing how it works. So as we, as we can see from the beginning, it's basically that every consumer is using uh, HCN names. And those names are basically given by the, the network service I talked at the beginning, which is uh, in this case implemented by this controller. And they are at the beginning they're loading the video from the servers using a pure IP network in the, in the middle. Then uh, during this demo in particular we wanted to show the benefits of, the, of many things, in particular of caching uh, at the edge of the network. So those three nodes, which are now gray, they will be like uh, activated, they will become HSN now. And uh, as you can see, is, uh, since they have a cache which was pre-populated, in this case because it was a demo, they are able to serve the content directly to the consumers by keeping the content at the edge and uh, just leaving a few requests uh, flowing until the end, uh, until the other uh, end where there are the actual servers uh, which uh, stores the, the video itself. And here you can see basically the amount of, uh, band of uh, traffic on the LT upstream, on the Wi-Fi stream and in the backhaul. And we can see as soon as we, uh, we activated the caches, the traffic on the backhaul uh, was uh, almost zero. Okay. So as a conclusion, uh, basically uh, the problem statement at the beginning uh, gave all four problems, which we um, solved into, into the following manner. So as a, for deploying, I say, into the existing internet, we designed HSN, which is a nice way to remap the HSN into, into IP. And uh, we tested it, and we, we showed we were able to traverse most of the tunnel system at the time. And we also integrated this, uh, integrated uh, the, with the, uh, Deployment to the endpoints using using uh, an SCN transport, which I present in the second part of the presentation. And uh, we use this transport after collecting it for uh, enabling uh, uh, SCN, uh, for enabling HTTP uh, to run on top of HSCN. Last part uh, of the of my work during these three years was basically this deployment uh, configuration management of the HSCN network using uh, SCN which I don't present here, but is in the thesis. And uh, everything is uh, basically open source. This is a summary of my contribution. So those are the papers. With the one is still under submission, the one of RTC. We did several demos during the three years. A uh, little talk on uh, the CRG. Then IoT patents in Cisco. And uh, two open source, uh, two big open source uh, which are uh, CSCN and uh, HSCN. 